Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Today we are looking at AQA A-Level Chemistry, Physical Chemistry Part 2. So you may have just joined me from Part 1 and this is obviously now Part 2. Uh, today's video is going to be covering thermody thermodynamics, rate equations, equilibrium constant, electropotentials in cells, acids and bases. So before we jump in, of course, the usual, feel free to subscribe for other A-Level Chemistry videos. Um, like this video, comment below any questions you have, and either myself or your fellow students will get to it. But let's just jump straight in. So starting with thermodynamics, so you've got the Bornhaber cycles, which are similar to the Hess, to Hess's law, which we saw in part one, allowing enthalpy changes to be determined, which cannot be measured directly. Lattice enthalpies are used for ionic substances, so lattice association en enthalpy is defined as the energy required to break apart an ionic lattice into its constituent ions in a gaseous state under standard conditions. Lattice formation enthalpy is defined as the energy required to form an ionic lattice from its constituent ions in a gaseous state under standard conditions. Atomization enthalpy is the energy required for the formation of a mole of gaseous atoms under standard conditions. I'm aware there's a lot of en different enthalpy definitions. Find a way that will help you learn and remember the differences between them and also as well the little symbols that go with them. We've got the enthalpy of electron affinity which is the enthalpy change when one mole of electrons is added to a mole of gaseous atoms under standard conditions. Then we have enthalpy of solution which is the enthalpy change when one mole of ionic solid is dissolved in water to infinite dilution so that the ions no longer interact under standard conditions. And finally, we have enthalpy of hydration, which is the enthalpy change when one mole of gaseous ions is dissolved in water to form one mole of aqueous ions under standard conditions. Enthalpy of solution and hydration are another way of measuring lattice enthalpies indirectly. But you can see on the right hand side, so the top image is what a Bornhaber cycle looks like. So you can see how these different enthalpies kind of change and go around will help you measure um, enthalpy changes and then in the below you've got a similar to Hess's law kind of diagram seeing how this um, these enthalpy changes take place and help you calculate them. So the perfect ionic uh, model hydration enthalpy per oh, let me start that again <laughs> the perfect ionic model so hydration enthalpy is heavily influenced by the size and charge of the molecules being dissolved. Therefore, it is assumed that the ions are perfectly ionic, all ions are perfectly spher spherical, and the ions display no covalent character. So you can see in the little image above, you can see what it means by ionic with covalent character, but then also perfectly ionic. So covalent character occurs in ions when two joined ions have varying sizes or charges, meaning the distribution of charge is not even. So hence why the... Uh, the ionic with covalent character in the image above um, is obviously a different shape because it's having that covalent character. Then we have, so in chemistry, things tend to tend towards a state of disorder. So entropy um, is a measure of the dis this disorder and the more disordered, the greater the entropy value. Again, we've got little symbols here that are important to remember for equations. Entropy increases as temperature increases as the particles gain energy and move further apart and gases have the greatest entropy. Obviously, they move around a lot more than liquid and um, solid, so there's a lot more uh, disorder there. When a substance melts or evaporates, there is a sudden increase in entropy and all spontaneous reactions have a positive entropy value. Gibbs free energy allows entropy to be calculated without measuring the effects of the surroundings and is negative for all spontaneous reactions, which is true at a certain temperature, which can be found by putting Gibbs free energy equal to zero. Changing temperature or type of reaction changes the feas feasibility of the reaction taking place. So you can kind of see here in the little diagram at the bottom how uh, entropy changes with each, uh, with each uh, state change. And then you've also kind of got a table that kind of clarifies the relationships between Gibbs free energy and enthalpy. Then we have a rate equation. So rate of reaction shows how fast reactions reactants are converted into products. 
dependent on the concentration of the reaction and rate constant. The constants M and N um, in the equation in the top right um, show the order of the reaction as different species have different effects on the reaction. So M plus N is the total order of the reaction. Orders of reaction go from zero to second order, changing concentration of reactants have has different effects on the whole reaction. And you can see in the table on the right hand side, you've kind of got exactly more, more information about what zero first and second order are. So zero order, concentration of the species has no effect on rate. So rate just is equal to the constant K. And you can kind of see it's just a straight line on the graph. And then first order, uh, concentration of the species and rate are directly proportional. So double concentration means doubling the rate. And then second order, so rate is proportional to the concentration squared. So doubling concentration means rate increases by four. Rate constant K when temperature is constant and found by rearranging the rate equation for that reaction. And you can see the rate equation at the bottom. It has varying units depending on the number of species and their orders of reaction, which is found by substituting units into the rearranged equation and cancelling. The equation in the bottom left, yes, what I just said about is the Arrhenius equation. I have no idea if I just said that correctly, but uh, we'll, we'll go with it. And this shows how rate constant K and temperature are related exponentially. Not all stages of reaction occur at the same rate, but the overall rate is determined by the slowest step. So the rate equation contains all species involved every stage up to and including the rate determining step. Rate equations can be determined experimentally by monitoring concentration of a reaction mixture over time. And then the tangent, when placed on a graph, the tangent is drawn at the point where exact concentration is known at the beginning of the reaction and repeated with varying concentrations. Now looking at the equilibrium constant, so Kp is the equilibrium constant used for gaseous equi equilibria. All reactants and products must be in a gaseous state for Kp to be calculated. Within a gaseous system, each gas has a partial pressure, which adds up to give the total system pressure, which can be found using the molar fraction of the substance and total pressure, commonly measured in pascals, but can also be in atmospheres. When it comes to calculating Kp, this is equal to the product of the partial pressures of products over the partial pressure of reactants. So you can see here essentially what the um, what equations will be useful and how you can kind of apply these. And then on the right hand side, you've got how it would look when you're when you're actually looking at an actual reaction, just to help clarify exactly what that means. So now on to electropotentials and cells. So electrochemical cells use um, uh, reduction reactions as the electron transfer, uh, I believe that's meant to be redox. Uh, so electrochemical cells use redox reactions as the electron transfer between products creates a flow of electrons. This flow is an electric electrical current which flows between electrodes in the cells and potential difference is produced between the two electrodes, which can be measured. Most cells consist of two solutions with metal electrodes and a salt bridge, which is a tube of unreactive ions that can move between the solutions to carry the flow of charge, but do not interfere with the reaction. Each solution is a half cell, which makes up the full chemical cell, and these half cells have a cell potential, which indicates how it will react, either oxidation or reduction. Representation, so it's really important that you draw these correctly. Uh, most negative half cell is on the left, um, and then the most oxidized species goes next to the salt bridge. A salt bridge is shown using a double line, um, always including state symbols. So you can see that's more so for the middle image there, you can see with zinc. Then standard hydrogen electrodes, so she is the measuring standard for half cell potentials. It has a cell potential of 0 0.00 volts, uh, measured under standard conditions. And again, standard conditions are one mole per decimeter cubed, 298 Kelvin and 100 um, kilopascals. So the cell consists of hydrochloric acid, hyd hydrogen gas, and uses platinum electrodes, which are very useful as they are metallic. So will conduct ele electricity, but also inert, so will not interfere with the reaction. So you can see how standard hydrogen electrode looks in that bottom diagram. And then if measured under standard conditions, cell potentials are measured compared to the she to give a numerical value for the half cell potential. 
Negative potentials mean substances are more easily oxidised and will lose electrons. Positive potentials mean the substances are more easily reduced and will gain electrons. Standard cell potential values are used to calculate overall cell EMF, so electromotive force. Most positive to most negative, minus the most negative. And if the overall cell potential is positive, then the reaction is spontaneous and favourable. Half cell reactions can be combined to give the overall cell reaction. The anti-clockwise rule is a good method for ensuring the reaction is formed correctly. Write the most negative EMF out of the pair on top. Draw anti-clockwise arrows around the reaction. Balance the electrons on both sides of the reaction and write out the cell reaction. Electropotentials that are very positive are better oxidising agents. The more oxidised those species, more negative than it. And any, any species that are very negative are better reducing agents and will reduce those less negative than it. Increasing concentration of the solutions makes the cell EMF more positive as few electrons are produced in the reaction and increasing pressure will make the EMF more negative as the electrons are produced. So you can kind of see here how uh, the oxidising agents, reducing agents impact and looking at the standard potential and as well an example of how you would combine these half equations. Then further from that, so electrochemical cells can be a useful source of energy for commercial use and can be non-rechargeable, rechargeable or fuel cells. In rechargeable cells, these, are, these have reversible reactions so can be reformed when used. Common rechargeable cells are lithium ion in phones, laptops and cars with a lithium cobalt oxide electrode and a graphite carbon electrode and an electrolyte of a lithium cell in an organic solvent to carry the flow of charge. In order to be recharged, a current has to be applied over the cell, which forces the electrons to move in the opposite direction and causes the reaction to reverse. Fuel cells are a type of electrochemi electrochemical cell used to generate an electrical current without needing to be recharged. E.g. a hydrogen fuel cell, which uses a continuous supply of hydrogen and oxygen from air to generate a continuous current. The reaction that takes place produces water as the only waste product, so it's more environmentally friendly, but the downside to hydrogen fuel cells include the high flammability of hydrogen, and of course they are expensive to produce. So you can see here in the bottom kind of how this would look for the different types of uh, cells. So on the right hand side is the uh, fuel cell and how this kind of works. And then you've also got the like a lithium battery, the rechargeable one. Then moving forward to finish off on acids and bases. So acid-base equilibria involve the transfer of protons between substances. Therefore, substances can be classified as acids or base depending on their interaction with protons. A Bronsted-Lowry acid is a proton donor and a Bronsted-Lowry base is a proton acceptor. Reminder, a strong acid is when it completely dissociates when in dissociates to ions when in solution of a pH 3 to 5, but weak acid only slightly dissociates in, pollution, in solution with pH 0 to 1, which also applies for strong and weak bases, except with pH 12 to 14 and pH 9 to 11, respectively. So pH is a measure of acidity and alkalinity on a logarithmic scale from 0 to 14, giving the concentration of H plus ions. Obviously, you'll know a lot about pH and things from GCSE, uh, water slightly dissociates two ions as an equilibrium with its own equilibrium. Why can I never say that word? Equilibrium constant Kw at twenty five degrees, um, giving it a constant value of one times ten to the power of minus fourteen. The forward reaction is endothermic and therefore favoured when temperature of the water is increased, and so more H plus ions are produced and water becomes more acidic as a result. Weak acids and bases only slightly dissociate in solution to form an equilibrium mixture, therefore re the reaction has an equilibrium dissociation uh, constant, Ka, and to calculate pH, um, if Ha is in excess, then use Ha, and A- minus along with Ka to find H+, plus, then pH, if A- minus is in excess, then use Kw to find H+, plus, then pH, if Ah is equal to A-, minus, then pKa equals pH, so find pKa. And obviously all these kind of different things will refer to the equations in the top, which you can see um, and how they work. And obviously key is as well, you need to remember that you can rearrange all these equations. Um, so just 
my favourite thing to do it was to highlight the key numbers that I've been given and really take a note of what I've actually got and what I need to find out. Then finally, so acids and bases again, so a pH titration curve shows how pH of a solution changes during an acid base reaction. When they react, a neutralization point is reached, which is identified as a large vertical section through the neutralization or equivalence point. To investigate, alkali is slowly added to an acid and the pH measured with a pH probe or vice versa. For a strong acid, strong base reaction, this neutralization point occurs around pH 7. Strong acid and weak base, pH is less than pH 7. Weak acid and strong base, greater than pH 7. And weaker, weak acid and weaker acid. Weak acid and weak base, pH 7. Specific indicators need to be used to determine certain pH ranges and changes. The most common are methyl orange and phenol... Yeah, I'm not going to try to say that. Uh, (laughs) um, Acidic buffer solutions contain a weak acid and the salt of that weak acid. And basic buffer solutions contain a weak base and the salt of that weak base. And you've got some key calculations. So calculating this, so acid and base. So find the number of moles of each species, calculate the constellation concentrations when at equilibrium using the total volume and use Ka to find H plus and therefore pH. Acid and salt, find the moles of the salt and use Ka to find pH. The pH of a buffer solution doesn't change much but will change in the order of minus 0.1 or 0.01. I believe that's meant to be just 0.1 or 0.01 units of pH when a small volume of acid or base is added. Adding small amounts of acid increases the concentration of the acid in the buffer solution, so the overall solution gets more acidic. Adding small amounts of base decreases concentration of acid in the buffer solution, meaning the overall solution gets slightly more basic. Buffer solutions are common in nature to keep systems regulated, which is important for enzymes or reactions in living organisms. So you can see on the right hand side as well, just some graphs of how these kind of different reactions will look based on strong acids or or like whether it's strong acid, weak acid, or strong base or weak base, um, kind of where you can recognise the equivalence point. And then in the bottom, you've got a little table just of what the colours are and what pH ranges they are for the indicators. So you can kind of make sure you know which one you're meant to be using. But that is everything for today's video. So that is physical chemistry all done and dusted. Next up, we'll be looking at inorganic chemistry. Again, there'll be two parts to that. And again, like I said at the beginning, please feel free to subscribe, like, and comment below any questions you have, and we can get back to you. We can answer them as soon as possible. And I shall speak to you soon.